Hi, I'm Joanne Varble. I lead the PowerFlex Systems Engineering Team. Um, Brian, uh, Dean, Brian, you want to introduce yourself? Him and I are going to be kind of co-presenting the software architecture for PowerFlex. This is a really interesting and unique product, and we're going to show you the architecture that enables that uniqueness. Um, today, we're going to cover, uh, we're going to focus a lot of it basically on the PowerFlex software-defined storage software itself. That is the core of this product offering. So formally Scale.io based on Scale.io. Um, we're also going to talk about the flexibility and the performance and the scalability that make this product unique and how we achieve that. And then thirdly, we're going to go into um, PowerFlex Manager. Um, if the software-defined storage software is the core of the product, uh, PowerFlex Manager is the orchestration and automation engine for the product. It brings more predictable um, outcomes for the customer and it helps you maintain uh, your system over time through its life cycle. All right, so I'm not gonna touch on all of the features. Um, the main point I wanna make with this before we dive in is this is an enterprise storage product and it does have uh, typical features that you'd want to see, you know, data service features around, you know, uh, asynchronous replication, snapshots, um, partitioning, all of that. But really what makes it unique is its flexibility and its scalability and its elasticity um, and its performance. So that's what we're going to focus on is how do we achieve that, some of that uniqueness. So first, um, we are a software-defined storage. We do run on x86 servers. Uh, we, we offer it on the PowerEdge. Um, that's definitely preferred. We can offer a lot more predictability when you have PowerEdge servers and the appliance and the integrated rack model. Um, but you, you do have the option to buy it as a software-only offering. What does it do? It takes servers and it basically um, abstracts the uh, local storage and makes a pull out of it. And now you have one big pull of storage that applications can, can leverage. So first you see PowerFlex um, discovering and abstracting the storage from where it actually lives within the ser servers. Then it pulls it all together. So instead of having, you know, in this scenario, 10 servers with 10 terabytes and 100K I I IOPS each, you have a pull of, 100 terabytes and a million IOPS that applications can, can consume. This is good, great because it's not, it doesn't limit your application to the storage that is available locally. And then we also have our software that automates, um, you know, distributing the workload or the data across the entire pool. Um, and managing rebuilds and um, rebalancing as those workloads change and the data needs change. All right, what are the various components that um, make up Power, uh, PowerFlex SDS? First one um, is, and we've already alluded to it a little bit, there is a software defined, um, a software data server. Now this really is kind of the smart hands that manages the, uh, drives and the, the data pool itself. Um, it's what discovers and aggregates those disks together and, and kind of exposes that virtual pool. Um, you can allocate to workloads based on, on volumes, logical partitions and volumes within that pool. This is going to be installed um, on any node that you want the storage within that server to be part of that pool. Now, one thing I did want to bring up is if this is a storage only node where you're leveraging the storage and you're not running workload, um, it can run within the bare metal. So it doesn't have to be a VM. On the HCI scenario, um, it would run as a VM. The second component is the storage data client or SDC. Um, the SDC is um, installed with uh, the, the compute, the workload um, on the host, and it's a, a kernel level driver, very much like your virtual H, um, uh, HBA. Um, what it does is it presents a mapping of the address space 
um, to the OS so that now the, the storage can be consumed as block storage. And this runs in multiple different um, you know, hypervisors and uh, bare metal OSs. So Joanne, um, you're talking about kernel level drivers. That's um, quite a challenge for some environments that perhaps don't want to go into let, putting um, kernel level drivers into their systems because of the additional testing and so on. Um, is that the only way this can be deployed with that level of driver on there? Um, it, it is today. Okay. And when you say a range of different operating systems and um, hypervisors, is that all of the Linux, Windows, ESX, etc.? Windows, Linux, ESX, um, KVM, Hyper-V, Citrix, yep. and there's, there's a whole list of them. You're talking about legacy Unix clients. Mm -hmm. Like now there are, there is a larger list of operating systems and hypervisors for which we provide the storage data client, than for which we provide the storage data server. Yeah. So, so. Uh, going back to the storage data service, you had the first slide where you were talking about uh, a varied um, set of nodes, so with different disks in it and uh, SSDs and VME devices and whatever. So does it mean that uh, all the perf all the load balancing on the on the system is made with an algorithm or something that uh, decides where to put the data so that I can have a consistent uh, performance out of uh, each single run that I create? Yeah, or let me talk about the third. The let me talk Sorry. about the third component. The third component is um, the metadata manager or the MDM. Um, this does, um, it's kind of like the, the director of the system. So what it, it does exactly what you were getting at, Enrico. Um, when you want to create a volume, it will map the address spaces for that volume across the various SDSs. Um, and it, it will make sure that it is balanced um, across the various SDSs. Can I just follow up on Enrico's question there slightly? You may get onto this. Um, do you do you add in some understanding of the um, the physical layout of the of rack and uh, racks and power connectivity to that um, ability to understand the distribution of the, the nodes? Because clearly, you want to make sure that when you distribute that data, that you don't create something where you might have a a risk that if you lose a, a set of servers or a rack or whatever, that you then lose data. We do. Um, we have protection domains that you can define. Um, so that will ensure that your second copy will be on a different protection domain, um, th which will serve exactly for the purpose you were just talking about. And so just to be clear, this you would need 246 nodes for this? So you would have always have two data servers? Two no. Okay, no, so we we'll start, start. We start at, at four nodes and um, yeah, this, I'll talk about how, th this picture is a little bit misleading. I'll talk about um, kind of the configurations next. Okay. All right. So the MDM, in addition to uh, kind of allocating uh, the space for the volume, it also monitors the system and it's what will initiate rebuilds um, or rebalances as well. Okay. So, Let's look at um, how the, the nodes, uh, how you, you form these different types of nodes that we support. You can do a storage only. This is if you're doing disaggregate, um, kind of the two layer is what we call that. Um, you need to install the um, SDS in order to have your storage be used as part of that pool within the server. The second is a compute only node. So for compute only node, all you need is the SDC. Um, if you want to do hyper-converged, all you really do is install both the compute and the storage um, within the same server, and now you've got a hyper-converged hyper solution. And my uh, virtual workloads can now um, you know, use the pool of storage that their drives are a part of. Joanne, where's the MDM in this configuration? You no, know, I didn't show that. The MDM is on installed 
um, within three or five nodes um, within the cluster itself. So it could be on any of these nodes, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Correct. Is MDM based on uh, Cassandra or something similar because of the three, five uh, nodes? No, that no? is a, a homebrewed, uh, it's like a Paxos, you know, quorum algorithm, uh, but it's a homebrewed thing. It's not dependent on Zookeeper or any other thing like okay. that. That's ours. And the minimum number of four is just to be sure that uh, the MDM is always uh, three node also if you have a failure? The hard limit is three. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. And, but we have four as a Best strongly practice. recommended minimum, just so there's an available amount of extra storage space for rebuild capacity in the system. Makes sense. Okay. You, you mentioned that you can have three or four or five uh, metadata nodes, but actually uh, you also mentioned that you have customers with thousands of nodes. Are they in a single cluster? Do you have a limitation of the number of nodes managed by uh, five uh, metadata nodes or number of lines or number of whatever? So what are the hard limits of the platform? Our, our biggest customers um, have like 7,000 nodes. I think the biggest cluster that they have within that is in like the 700 node range. Um, you know, Brian, I, I'm not aware of any technical limits. Um, what do we have any marketing ones? Well, we, we will other than you run out of this switch capacity. We will say that a given MDM cluster uh, can manage up to 512 of the SDS nodes and 1024 of the SDCs. Um, uh, you could push the SDSs higher theoretically, maybe, but we, we won't. Um, that's a sizable amount of, of things. And then there are other limits inside it, like a storage pool can only contain so many nodes, you know. But number of volumes is in the tens of thousands. Thanks, Brian. Okay. So this is just to recap the configurations that we support. Um, you can do the disaggregated two layer. Again, your compute is separate than your storage. HCI, if you install your SDS and your SDC on the same node, now I've got an HCI configuration and you can mix and match. So, you know, you can have configurations that have, you know, the two layer for your bare metal workload. And then in the same cluster, you can have HCI uh, nodes as well. So it is very flexible in the way that you can, can build. And, and even grow it over time. You know, it's so easy to add additional nodes and pick what personality you want. Um, we found that a lot of customers will start with a smaller cluster and it's kind of like that Cookie Monster or Pac-Man effect. Um, they got another workload they, they want to deploy and they just grow the cluster pretty quick and deploy the workload and are using this infrastructure. All right, now let's look at how um, the three different software components work together. So what I wanna kind of talk through here is when you create a volume, what happens? When you create a volume, um, the MDM is the one that um, it assigns the address spaces to that volume across the SDSs. Now the SDSs will manage and decide physically where it goes within the drives that it manages but the MDM spreads it across the, the SDSs themselves. It will send a mapping of the address space to the SDC. The SDC with that mapping knows for what address space exactly which SDS to um, contact and it will contact it directly and communicate with it directly and route it directly there. So, so are, you, are you hashing the, uh, I'll call it the block volumes across the SDS clusters or? How, how do you, I mean, it looks like you're allocating the, the blocks across all the cluster nodes, not just a segment of them. Yes. Across yeah. all nodes that contribute to a storage pool. Yep. Oh, and so there are separate storage pools that could be potentially divided across the cluster. Yep. What's the, what's the, what's the size of a storage pool? What's the limitation of a, how many nodes, SDS nodes could be in a storage pool? 
something less than 512, I would imagine. It is. I'm trying to remember uh, off the top of my head. It's in the 30, 40. Okay, 30, 40. That's fine. That, that's good. Thanks. All right. And then, um, again, the MDM will, will, will balance the, so that your writes and your reads are all balanced across the cluster themselves. And, and a clarification question. The MDM data is mirrored across all the MDM nodes? Uh, it keeps a replica across them. Uh, there is always a primary and then secondaries and tiebreakers. Um, and so they share a small database among them that stays consistent across them, but only one of them acts in, at a time as the lead. Okay, thanks. All right. So this basically um, shows the distributed architecture. You can tell that the... Um, each of the, the clients can talk directly to the, um, the storage nodes or the SDSs themselves. Um, real lightweight communication. Um, because they have that mapping, they know exactly where to go to. So you don't have any redirects or any um, you know, multicasting. It's a real efficient use of the network itself. Um, you don't have any uh, caching uh, layer either. All the drives are equal in there. There's no cache. You write directly to, to the drives within the system. Um, and because of the performance and the fact that you've got all these kind of uh, multiple controllers, you know, each basically um, SDC and SD, SDS is its own, own mini controller, um, there's also no need for data locality. So that's a little bit different than you see in some of the other um, software-defined storage solutions. So, so when a volume is created and it's allocated across the storage pool, that sort of uh, block mapping would not change unless it was a failure someplace in the storage pool. Is that how it would work? That's correct. Okay, it's not. It's not a dynamic mapping. It's a very static map environment. Well, I would say either if something leaves or something yeah. comes into. If yeah, exactly. If there's a change in the configuration, then something would have to change. I got you. Or you're doing some rebalancing. Okay, and again, this is, is over uh, Ethernet connection, so no fiber channel, no iSCSI. Okay, so I'm using uh, RDMA, RDMA for uh, for Ethernet or uh, some way to Im to improve uh, the network uh, uh, the network connection and. Uh, the reduce the latency are you using rdma or uh, or not no the protocol we use is proprietary it's our own uh, for the storage communications uh, between the sdcs and the sdss so and it it's a very efficient lightweight thing that's part of our secret sauce and is ip based is the ip based is based on IPv4, v v6, uh, or uh, yeah, yeah, it's over a TCP port. TCP, TCP okay, it's not Yep. And, Good. and you support as backend storage, NVMe SSDs, uh, storage class memory, disk devices, all that, anything that a server could attach to. Is that correct? In theory, yes. Uh, we have certain things we validate and support, <laughs> but yeah, ah. we're agnostic to the underlying storage media. Okay. Then, how do you manage uh, different uh, uh, tiers of storage? I mean, if you have uh, NVMe devices, SAS based flash devices, and nearline uh, mechanical devices, so how do you manage uh, all the different? Uh, yeah, do do you do you organize them in different pools? Do you have a, a team exactly. mechanism or yeah. something that to move that around, or? Uh, that's exactly correct. Uh, you would uh, you'd have those uh, grouped into pools in which similar media are together in the pool. And that's true even if those are in the same node, like you've got half dozen NVMe and you've got a bunch of SAS SSDs in that, you would simply, and you've got say five nodes, you would carve that up so that those five nodes create two pools, uh, one using the NVMe media, one using the SAS SSD. 
but do you, you you don't have any tiering uh, option right not as an automatic thing but you can joanne we'll talk about this you can migrate the volume between the pools yeah but i can't i can't build an hybrid volume made of uh 10% of SSDs and 90% of uh, hard drives, a single volume. And then I, you know, I write hot data on the, on the first tier. And then when it gets cold, it migrates automatically on the second tier. Think for a moment about the picture she had up a couple slides ago, where you had a map that the MDM provides of the volume address space across all the SDSs and their drives. So the address space of that volume is evenly distributed across all the media and re reads and writes take place equally onto all the disk media. If you have spinning disks and NVMe in there and you're trying to do that, like a hiking party, you're going to go as fast as the slowest member. Because it's equally. Oh, I, I totally get it. I mean, in uh, le let's make an example here. Do you know the uh, EMC as uh, compellent? Okay, so they have automatic tiering. So you can have a flash drive mm -hmm. on top, and underneath you can have an hard drive. You okay. write on the flash drive, and data automatically migrates on the on the hard drive. It's called automated tiering. Okay. Right. Which we're okay. not doing. We but do not do that. That's not a part of the architecture. That, that, that's the answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So you may say, well, you can get, when you pull all that storage together, you can get a lot of IOPS. Um, you can. And um, it's good to have extra because all those, those IOPS and because we've got where all the SDCs and, and SDSs can, can uh, talk together, um, we actually have very, very fast recovery time. So if you lose a node or you use a drive, um, the system recovers uh, extremely fast. In this particular um, example configuration here, um, we have 29 drives and uh, I'm sorry, uh, 29 nodes. And um, uh, a, a total of 285 disks. Um, if you lose a, a drive, it's recovering in less than two minutes, which means I'm take, making a second copy of the data to another drive. And if you lose a whole node, it's um, just over 18 minutes. So really, really fast recovery times. Okay, let's talk about the um, two data layouts that we support. Um, when we first launched the product, um, the original data layout we had was medium granularity storage pools, very lightweight, uh, very fast performance. Um, it, it actually allocated the um, the member the uh, address spaces in one megabyte uh, units. That's great if you're looking for performance, but when you start adding some of these data services, it's probably not the most optimal configuration. So uh, we added in our 3.0 fine granularity. Fine granularity, um, the storage pools now um, allocate the um, address spaces in four kilobytes. Um, and, and again, these are all spreading those across the drives as it allocates it. Um, you support both thick and thin provisioning within the medium granularity, whereas you've only got the thin provisioning within fine granularity. Um, another difference between the two is for medium granularity, you can use, you know, even spin in media, SSDs and NVDEM media, but for fine granularity, it requires uh, the flash media. Uh, it also requires um, persistent memory. So NVDEM is a requirement for those configurations where you're running fine granularity. Um, um, one of the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, how are you going to support um, uh, write intensive workloads or intensive workloads when you move to QLC where writing four kilobyte blocks probably isn't going to be attractive on that type of media? Um, is this just going to be 4K on everything or are you going to look at how you manage more, more difficult media like QLC? So 
you can pick which layout you want based on what's more optimal for your workload. Um, you know, if you're doing um, inline compression, then you need the fine granularity. Um, you know, also the fine granularity is better when you're doing a lot of snapshots as well. If you have an 8K snapshot and you're allocating, you know, one meg for the address space for 8K, it's not, you know, as efficient. Okay, but, let me... Let me rephrase the question slightly. Okay. Um, when I was writing to a hard drive, a one megabyte unit might be an acceptable size unit to write to. When I was writing to um, SLC storage or MLC storage, a 4K unit might be access uh, acceptable to write to because the drive is capable of managing that endurance and and coping with the, um, the overhead of the uh, small box size. As I moved to TLC and QLC, um, you look at other vendors and they're having to write to those devices in a serial fashion rather than a random fashion in order not to burn the drive out. But your architecture basically disperses the data in an entirely random fashion. So it looks to me like you will have a struggle when you move towards TLC and QLC media to support the, the use of your distributed architecture on those platforms. Um couple of comments on this one. These really dense, multi-layered uh, flash media do present new problems. And we are in the process of validating how to handle them. So you're not going to order them, for example, in our appliances a rack right now. Okay. Second, uh, in the fine granularity storage pool, the non-volatile RAM plays a role as something akin to a write cache where as the data is coming in, the writes are coming in, we're bringing them into NVDIM. At this point, we're running them through the inline compression algorithm to make sense of how to place them. Uh, and then we actually use underneath the hood, uh, like a log structure array type thing. They get organized into 128K logs. And then as those fill, we destage those back to the SSDs underneath. So we are not actually hammering those disks all the time with the little writes. All that takes place in RAM. And then as writes change, like the next write didn't compress to the same size, so you get that fragmentation in the logs and the SSDs. We read those least used ones back into the NVDIM as a cycling process, do the compaction in, in, in RAM. And so we get free garbage collection out of this basically. Uh, and we don't burn on the SSDs. So that is sort of how in that fine granularity storage pool, we uh, and it, it, it help the endurance level of the, of the SSDs. Okay, and I guess go, what it means is going forward, going forward, you're gonna have to do more of that because in order to support uh, less endurance media, you'll need more um, either NVDIMs right or absorption. more cache in there to, to absorb that additional sort of randomness before you write it out. So, and, and the question, so in the fine granularity storage pools, all the SDSs will require um, the same amount of NVDIM or, or can it be different? It depends on the amount of storage capacity in the node. Oh, so it's a ratio of the storage capacity. I got you, okay, thanks. Right. And then um, both have persistent um, checksums. Uh, we introduced it right out of the gate for fine granularity with our 3.5 release that we just launched. Um, we added it to medium granularity as well. And like I, I said, um, you can actually mix and match these within a cluster. When you, um, you know, configure a storage pool, you pick which data layout that you want to use for that storage pool. And if you, like Brian was alluding to earlier, if you uh, decide you want to change and you're using, you've got a you know storage within a um, MG storage pool and you decide you want to compress it, then you just do a live migration to a store uh, FG storage pool and it can um, compress it on its way. Okay, let's talk a little bit about asynchronous replication. I talked to you about the three key software components, the SDS, the SDC, and the MDM. With um, asynchronous replication, we introduced a fourth component, and that's the SDR. The SDR uh, kind of sits in between the SDC and the um, 
uh, SDS, and it does all of the journaling and is responsible for um, transporting that data or, or sending that data to um, the remote uh, cluster itself. Uh, it is has the same characteristics that the SDS and the SDC. It's very elastic and scalable. And you install it with this first release. It is installed alongside the SDS itself. Um, for the initial release, which was 3.5 that we launched this, it is only supported for two layer. It does not support HCI at this time. Okay, what are we replicating? We're replicating volumes or a set of volumes. Um, if you look at um, this particular, um, this bolts. So what, what we do is we define a replication consistency group. Um, applications today sometimes have multiple data sets that they need to stay consistent. So when you uh, pick a volume that you want to um, replicate, you assign it to a replication consistency group. Now that consistency group could have one or it could have multiple volumes in it. And um, it will ensure that that data is replicated and stays consistent as it is replicated. Um, today with the first release, we replicate from one-to-one -one or bi-directional. So the many-to-many -many or many-to-one isn't supported yet. That will come in a future release. Brian, do you have anything you wanna to add to this one? Question. Um, um, not are yet. you going to offer this as a as a service as well? Is this something that will be offered through your uh, through your partners? Um, if I have uh, a single data center, can I use this um, with the, you you or with your partners in in the future? That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, it's not set up that way right now, but I mean. So the uh, consistency groups are within a storage pool. So volumes within a storage pool would could potentially be in the same consistency group, but volumes across storage pools cannot. As long as they're in the same protection domain, which is a slightly broader category, um, because you could have, and it doesn't matter source and target. So you could have thin provision, compressed volumes in a fine granularity storage pool on your source. You could be sending them to different media, different kind of data layout on the target. Um, you know, we're, there's a bit of um, asymmetry there you can have between your sources and targets. And it's it's journaled asynchronous. So is there <clears throat> is there some sort of time constraint that's put on the uh, actual um, art PO, I guess. Yep. You you set it between out of the gate. We're supporting between thirty seconds and an hour. Okay. Yep. Okay. So now let's look at what that I data flow. Again, because I saw journaling now, and maybe I missed something in the in the previous uh, slide when we you were talking about all the operations that you do before uh, eating the the actual. Uh, flash memory okay and uh, i was distracted for a moment and i didn't understand so, uh, exactly the data path so do you make all the operation in ram and then you write you eat the the, the disk later when when you to organize the blocks to not uh, wear out the devices right did you say something like that only for the fine granularity data layout with okay. The what happens if I lose, you know, uh, power while I'm working on uh, on uh, you know, all this operation before eating the drive? It requires an NVDIM. You're not you're doing it in non-volatile RAM, so right. you're going to have your battery uh, uh, to cache that and destage it. Ah, okay, so all the nodes have. So if you use the fine granularity, you also need a uh, an NVDIM yes. to enable this. Ah, okay, it was not clear. Okay, very good. Yep. Okay, so now I'm, I'm going to go through what the IO path looks like. Um, if you are not replicating a volume, your IO path does not change. Um, the data goes from the SDC directly to the SDS. Um, if you are replicating it, you've got the SDR kind of in between. 
The SDR to the SDC, it kind of looks like an SDS. Um, until an SDS, it kind of looks like a, an SDC. Um, so the SDR will um, pass through the data to the SDS, and it will also in parallel be journaling the data, um, writing it to a journal. The journal itself is a volume, and that volume is spread um, across uh, the nodes and balanced across the, the various nodes and drives. Um, and then the data is then transmitted over to the, um, the, the target cluster itself, um, where it is stored in, in, into the SDSs. Now, one interesting thing, because it is a volume at the, um, the disaster recovery cluster, you can actually go and test your, your disaster recovery. You can have set up a, a client with an SDC and you could, could have access to your data and you could snapshot it. Um, so you could test your DR site um, without impacting any performance or, or workload. Um, and you, you could also um, you know, kind of offload and do additional data analytics and stuff like that at your remote cluster if you need to. Uh, excuse me, the metadata synchronization that's, that's occurring there is, so once you decide you're gonna replicate uh, a volume in a consistency group, that whole consistency group uh, volume structure, let's say, is gonna be replicated as well. Is that how it works? The replication consistency group ensures that all the volumes within it share the same RPO and are consistent amongst each other they crash consistent so that IO perspective, IO timing right. perspective kind of things. Yeah, no, so I understand that. When the target system validates that they've successfully written to their own SDSs and permanently store the data, uh, they'll only do that as long as everything's consistent. So, you know, if you've got one SDR slowing down the rest of them, the RPO could drift out of compliance. Right. So uh, ab about the older application process, uh, uh, do you organize the metadata in, in uh, you know in in large uh, chunks before moving them? Because otherwise, if you have several lines and you have to move all the metadata, you have a lot of small packets going back and forth, and it would be very challenging for the network. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna ship uh, segments of. Uh, time basically as you're moving the those journals uh, in the replication uh, scheme and then you know before we do that even depending on your RPO and how it's set uh, once you've got a bunch of writes coming into the journaling volume we're going to do write folding on those to make sure that we're only taking the last writes to those address spaces and send that you know and then it goes in a, a unit chunk together right all right I am going to move on to maintenance mode um, Prior to our 3.5 release, we had two ways of handling putting a node in maintenance mode. The first one is you remove the node from the cluster, you do your maintenance on it, and then you bring it back into the cluster. So when you do that, when you remove the node itself, um, you start rebalancing um, and, 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 or, and re, um, reduplicating and, and copying a new, new um, the, the, the data, so you've got the second copy. Now, when you bring the node back, it goes back through the whole rebalancing scenario. Um, that takes a while because now I've got a bunch of nodes where I uh, made my second copy and I am rebalancing it back to the original node. So now I've got you know, many different you know, nodes and drives, um, you know, actually, you know, uh, hydrating the data back to one node. So that's very slow. So if you're, you're going through and like you're doing updates and you're taking a node out of the cluster and then you put it back in using this scenario, I have to wait till the rebuild's done and the rebalancing is done before I can take my next node out. So very, very time consuming. Jo Joanne, uh, you mentioned that I, I guess I haven't asked this question yet. The data protection capability in, in PowerFlex is, is a, a, you mirror the data? Is that how it works? Yeah, it gets its resiliency through a mirror. Yeah. Okay, I got you. Thanks. Sorry, I probably should have covered that. <laughs> Sir, and how do you cope with the, you know, the, the cost of uh, SSDs and, uh, you know, the, uh, 
uh, even even the latest uh, of 10 memory dims i mean it's very expensive to do all the rep um, replication of the data instead of erasure coding or things like that you're asking about the efficiency of that because we got a 50 percent overhead yeah um uh, it's just i mean a dollar the trade-off is that we get a really efficient and fast rebuild out of the way we do it um Yes, part of the trade-off is that you know we have a, a reduction in space because of that, because we always do a mirror of every copy onto some other fault unit somewhere else in the cluster. Mm. And you do only c compression for these fault units, so not the duplication plus compression. Correct. Okay. Do Do you have any dollar per gigabyte number that you can share about your? Uh, your systems I and mean, just to have an idea because because you know everybody else does compression and the duplication meaning that you know they can save some from these very expensive devices so that you know they can get like power store four to one uh data compression meaning that you know they, they can save a lot of money from flash memory Otherwise, it's very, you know, uh, very expensive. So you don't have any data reduction guarantee, per se. Are they going to do that at the reduction? Um, we don't offer it yet. For example, as a part of the uh, the program that Sue was talking about earlier, the future proof guarantee. Uh, yet, uh, we'll get about two to one. Uh, you know, in good cases. Um, but the other thing to kind of consider is that this isn't aimed at primarily a mid-range market. This is a part of our high-end storage. Um, so it's really aimed at very high performance and you know high expectation systems. Yeah, ahead, and, and, align, and, just... and aligning the full outcome, right? I mean, it's compute and storage all together. So when you think about when we deliver it, it's the value of someone buying an engineered system and it, uh, you know something that delivers the outcome uh, that that drives the value of the product as well. It's just not storage. Mm -hmm. Brian, can I just extend the um, the discussion that you're looking at with maintenance modes here, and ask the question: If you have got customers that have potentially thousands of nodes, thousands of disks, and drives, whatever, um, are you doing any proactive uh, validation of those drives to go across them and look at them and see whether they're um, still working correctly and um, and rebuild data in the background you might think being, has become corrupted or damaged or drives that might be not responding properly? Yes, we didn't get into that in here. Um, okay. So there, there in addition to the checksums on the um, on the data that's written, uh, we're all, we are tracking to see if we've got bad read sectors. And right, okay, so it's like, part of the architecture, okay. Yeah. All right. The second method is instant mess, uh, maintenance mode. So essentially what you're doing is you're um, telling the cluster that I'm gonna take this node out, don't rebalance, don't do anything, don't do any recovery activities. And um, you pull the node out of the cluster. Now, the negative thing is in this scenario, you only have the single copy available. So if something happens and if you have a failure in the cluster while that you know node is offline, you could have data unavailability until it comes back. Um, and potentially, if it doesn't come back, you could possibly even have data loss. Um, so this is a really good thing if you're going to pull the node out and do something really quick and it's low risk, and then bring it back in. If you think it's going to stay out of the cluster um, for any real length of time, you probably don't want to use this mode. So we only had those two options. You know, it takes a long time to you know, pull it out and put it back in or, but I, you know, I'm, I'm making duplicates. So I, I'm, I'm more protected. My data is more protected or, um, you know, I'm pulling it out and I'm sit, running with a single copy until I get it back into the cluster. So with 3.5, we actually offered a third option and that's what we call um, protective maintenance mode. So when you actually put the, the uh, node in protective maintenance mode, it, automatically starts creating that second copy. And it's gonna be a temporary copy, but it starts um, creating that copy. Um, and, and that way you're protected. So when you take it out, 
um, you've got your two copies. And that's pretty fast because you've got you know the data being copied to multiple nodes themselves. Um, during protective maintenance mode, um, as you write new data, it will actually um, track what writes are happening. Um, so you get the two copies, but it tracks what the new writes are while that node is in maintenance mode. And then when you bring it back, um, I don't have to do all that, that um, rehydration and everything for the node. All I have to do is sync the writes that occurred after that node was put into maintenance mode and between the time that it came back online. So much faster to be able to pull the node out, do your services and put it back in and make sure that you've got that second copy and your data is protected. You know, this was a, a product that was acquired in 2013 and we, I, I think we didn't see a huge amount about it. And then it went to being a, a hardware only solution, but maybe there was a bit of confusion about whether it was still software. Um, what's the commitment going forward to developing this product for the enterprise? Because I'm, I'm not really sure I've seen a lot that seems to have changed since the product was first released in 2013. So I'd love to understand what your commitment to this is and how much development will go into it. I, I think part of, if you want to think about it in terms of uh, the company's commitment, the very fact that this is a part of our powered up line, um, basically doubling down on this as a product uh, with a, you know, a distinct set of capabilities and a future for it. Uh, as far as some things not changing, it's true that the underlying architectural principles are the same. So uh, the team did a, a tech field day back in 2016 and uh, demonstrated some of these things, explained some of these things, but you don't destroy a good thing. Uh, the underlying architectural principles proved themselves to be extremely scalable and performant and resilient and elastic. So you add on new services by means of the fine granularity uh, data layout, um, it, which just take the same principles and extend and evolve them. Same thing with the asynchronous replication. It takes the same principles behind the uh, flexibility of the system and reapplies them and extends them to enable that, you know, we're supporting 30 second RPO, but we can actually go quite a bit less. And that's the real beauty of doing the journal based replication versus snapshot. Uh, we can get down to really low RPOs and still maintain that scalability through hundreds and hundreds of nodes. Hey, Brian, I also want to add, we have done a lot of investment in PowerFlex Manager. We're mm -hmm. really focusing on how do we take this just from high end enterprise where people are having to build it themselves and it's more complex to simplify in it and enable you to easily manage your infrastructure throughout its life cycle. Um, that way it scales beyond just that you know, large IT shops that have the you know, personnel to, to manage it. Yeah, so if I could wrap that together, um, it's still a software first platform. Uh, that what's what defines it and how it operates and does enables all of its services and functions. Uh, but when you have something that's that flexible and has that many options, people can trip themselves up with it. And we had that experience. And so, you know, it's like, uh, to use a poor analogy, you know, you can put Android on really cheap phones and it doesn't work so well. <laughs> uh, but you can put it on really great phones if you know what you're doing and it works wonderfully. But if you can control the ecosystem in which the software works best, uh, you get a really, really reliable product for the end user. And uh, that's partly what we've done with the appliance and the racks and then the PowerFlex manager orchestrating that entire, entire uh, stack.